Hi all, this video is going to be on anti-spyware, uh, the anti-spyware profile and DNS security and it was basically, it was brought about because in my previous video, which I think the link to is at the end of this, uh, the initial config 5 video, there was a comment made about the DNS security and how it differs in version 10 to 11, which we'll cover. So we're going to go through the whole thing here. DNS is the linchpin of pretty much everything that's done on the internet or um, or within our within our home, home or uh, work environments for that matter. I mean, everything is pretty much DNS based, so we need to protect it as much as we possibly can. Okay, so under our rule, which is our LAN to internet rule, we've got the profile settings here, and the profile settings we've got is we've got a default group. So we've got the group created for all the security profiles. They can be found here. We can see what's in that group by clicking there. Okay, once we've clicked there, we can see we've got an antivirus profile, anti-spyware vulnerability and URL filtering. Say my lack of imagination means that they're actually called what they are. Uh, so anti-spyware is where we control the DNS um, subscriptions. Um, and we'll we'll go into that now. Okay, so your anti-spyware profile is basically made up of policies, exceptions, DNS policies, and DNS exceptions. Okay, so what we're dealing with here is um, a clone of the strict policy. So these are, as you can see, if I just drop this down here, which I can't drop down that far, but we have default and strict. Those are included. They're already on the on the firewall, and they have these these policies configured in them. The policies themselves can be altered. Um, they can't be altered in the one that's on the box because that's read only, but we can edit the policy here. So we can change that for uh, the action that we want. We can have reset both, which is the action that we're gonna have. And then the only thing I would change here in when you initially put in these policies in is the packet capture itself. So for critical, I'd always go for an extended capture that then takes extended capture across the global option, which I believe is five packets. We're going to click OK on that. And then we're going to go to our simple high rule, which again is simple high, threat name any, category any, but it's it's based on this severity here. So if we select these different severities, that is what's going to match this rule. And then we're going to do a single packet capture on this one. Okay, you can also see as well that within the, uh, if we're creating the policies, we can actually give it a threat name and that can match any signature contained in the entered text. Uh, we have the categories here so we can start writing policies for a specific category as well. We've got web shell, spyware, networm, fraud, so on. Um, and we have the action there, all the actions that we can take based on that. We've got block IP and that will track by the, the IP. Uh, and then the packet caption, then the severities. And it can be a member of multiple. Um, as a general rule, when you're first setting out with these types of things, just go for something that's kind of general and broad until you get an idea of what your, your environment's gonna, gonna challenge you with. And then you can start to write um, more and more uh, progressively granular policies. Okay, so these also, these rules are in a top-down fashion. You can move them up and you can move them down and we can also find the matching signatures. So we're gonna find the matching signatures for our simple high rule and of course there's nothing there so the reason for that is this it automatically it enters the the search text of um, rule and its policy so it's named as policy so these are our signatures we've got here see if I can make it a bit bigger so these are our signatures that we've got here that are all going to match that simple high policy and that is because it's got severity of high and then we've got the actions that we're going to have there now if we want to create an exception we can create an exception here. We can enable that exception. If, for instance, we wanted to put IP addresses, that could be a source or destination IP, we can add those in there. Um, and then we wanted to change the action and so on. But we're not going to do that in this particular one. We're going to look at signature exceptions later. What we're really interested in at the minute is, which was the, uh, the, the basis of the question, is DNS policies. When we look at DNS policies, the DNS policies tab, we have the signature source. And we have the Palo Alto default DNS. So that's going to come down now, content update, as it says there, uh, Palo Alto Networks content. The policy action for that by default is sinkhole and the packet capture is disabled. And then DNS security again with our DNS security subscription. So that's what we have to have in place for these to be, these are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, these are on the device anyway. So when you go to anti-spyware profile, 
you'll see these options, but they won't be acted upon unless you've got DNS, a valid DNS security subscription and uh, threat prevention. Uh, well, advanced threat prevention or threat prevention license. Okay, so looking down here, we've got the ad tracking domains, command and control domains, dynamic DNS hosted domains, and all this then backs off to the cloud subscription service. So it's, it's very, very low latency. It's very sort of quick, and it can capture a lot of... Uh, a lot of zero day stuff as, and stuff that hasn't been had time to go down to the uh, the signatures so what we're going to do is we're going to test it and we're going to test it by using the uh sorry got confused there we're going to test it by using this which is the dns security test domains which is uh from palo alto of course um and we're going to show how we test that as well because there was a couple of things that I, I did I'll confess I got a little bit confused by when first doing it um, and we'll test and show just how we can we can verify that this is now working okay so coming back to our firewall so for our ad tracking domains we're gonna have an allow and a block and disable and disable and this is this is the current profile that is on the device so for instance if we go to if we go back to our desktop so ad tracking domains is here. So if we just click on that and we get a Google 404 error. That is because, sorry if switching's making you feel a bit, bit ill. That is because for our ad tracking domains, we've got a default action of allow. But I'm assuming that behind this at, at Palo Alto, there is no actual page to serve for that. It doesn't exist because this is to test the DNS. And of course the DNS, once blocked, would you would never get there. You just never get to the page. So the page doesn't actually have to exist. Now, if we go for command and control domains, which has got the policy action of block, if we go back to our desktop, clear that, and command and control, so C2, we can see that rather than just returning that 404 immediately, we now get it spinning over and over. And that is because it's been caught by our, our uh, anti-spyware profile. And then we get DNS probe, there we've got it. DNS probe finished next domain. Check if there's a typo because it doesn't exist and that's because it's been blocked. Okay, so if we then come back to our firewall, we cancel out of this and we go to look at the monitor tab. In the threats, in the monitor tab, we should see the test c2 testpanw.com at the top, which indeed we do. So the threat logs here, so we now, we're reading the logs through, we can see the receive time for the log, the type is spy word, the threat ID name is the generic test c2 testpanw.com, which we've seen. Where it's coming from, where it's going to, the source address, again, if we had uh, user ID configured, we've got the source user, we'd have that. The destination address, this is DNS lookup, so this is where they're going to. Um, the port 53 because I've blocked uh, UDP 443 and 80 so I've blocked quick protocol basically the application DNS base the action for it the severity and the URL that we went to okay so you, now you might want to sort of you might want to look at uh, capturing packets and everything like that and how do we change that but out of the box you can see that as long as everything is correct on the Palo Alto side, which there's no reason to believe it wouldn't be, <clears throat> out of the box, simply enabling it uh, and having it on there and using the, 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 standard, um, the standard settings means you do have some level of, um, some level of security, uh, a much greater level of security than you would have previously. And again, this works for, if we go back to our, go back to our desktop, we get again, that one uh, ransomware all these are being blocked and you know we'll be able to check they're being blocked okay so i come back to the firewall just quickly spin the logs over again so that we can see we've got the ransomware test and everything like that okay and then the medium the uh, medium severity there okay so going back to our anti-spyware profile because now we're going to look at the best practice for setting up the anti-spyware profile for the DNS security what they suggest is they suggest that you set everything to sinkhole so setting everything to sinkhole basically we can do that here 
uh, I don't think you can do it at the top actually no so okay so we'll do it here so we're going to set this to sinkhole set this to sinkhole 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 He probably should have paused it for that, if the truth be told. But now where we have highs and we have um, sort of mediums, what I'd be tempted to do, I, I mean, I, I do take issue with the fact that command and control is high. I would have said that was critical personally. But let's say we wanted to do a packet capture as well for command and control, malware domains, It's, it's a bit difficult clicking around this, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, yeah, and that's, what, and that's what we'll go for. Okay, so now we've done that. So our command and control is it's all going to be sinkhole, and the malware domains is going to be single packet. So now what's going to happen then is the DNS response coming back to my, uh, to my desktop is going to be given this sinkhole.paloautonetworks.com. It's going to be given that IP. Or we could give it another. We could give it another IP. We can um, send it to to wherever we want. As a general rule, uh, one of the things that people would do is you'd have a just a sinkhole address that doesn't exist, and then you can start to run reports on the people that are, are accessing that and the IPs that are accessing that simply by running a report against that IP address. You just got to remember, of course, it's got to be on the other side of the firewall. So if you're on the land side, then you'd have to put that on a zone where the traffic's going to have to go over the firewall. So we're going to OK that. OK, and now we're going to commit it. OK, so that's just finishing and we'll see what, what happens once that's committed. OK, we'll close that down now. Go back to our desktop and we'll click on our C2. We get a response straight away now. Uh, we we'll click on our malware. Again, we get a response straight away. Okay, so then coming back to our firewalls, come back to our firewall, we go to monitor tab. Look in the monitor tab for the test malware and the C2 communication. Okay, so we can see the malware there, and we can see that the action has been sinkhole, and that was that came straight back as we saw. We've got the packet capture symbol here, so we can have a look at the packet capture for that, which is, uh, if you remember, the malware was a single packet. Uh, and if we just go along and see if we can find the C2 test, we've got a packet capture for that as well. And we can export that. Also, that was an extended capture, so that was the five captures, uh, five packets, um, and we could open that and look in, uh, look in Wireshark if we wanted to, which I won't actually do at the minute because I have an issue with Wireshark, which means that the resolution is really ridiculous and nobody can see anything. So now we can see that we're using our DNS uh, security subscription. It's configured within our policy. We can see that when we go to the test, we can see that it's coming up as it should do, uh, and that's that's it basically configured um, to begin with. So uh, in the next video, we'll look at more of the exceptions, and then we'll start to look more at the differences between the two, as well as the decryption of uh, DNS. So this is things so we're going to do a whole series on DNS. So we need to look at the decryption of DNS. We have DNS crypt, the fact that uh, quick can't be uh, decrypted so we need to block quick and how that the browsers handle that the browsers then fall back to normal DNS um, and then probably situations where you wouldn't want to do that so if you had DNS proxy for instance and your DNS proxy was going to use encrypted DNS well that's actually beneficial you just don't want encrypted DNS from a host and the reason you don't want encrypted DNS from a host is because you you don't know whether that host has been compromised. Whereas if you're gonna, if you have a trusted and you have a secured DNS server, 
then you would have all your host pointing at that. You'd have all your DNS being evaluated to those internal DNS servers. Then that internal DNS server then would go out onto the internet, completely encrypted, to uh, pick up its its resolutions, and um, and then that would be the most secure way of doing it. Okay, so that's that's it for this video. Um, please check back often, uh, and I'll keep trying to upload them on a very regular basis, and we'll go further into the whole DNS security uh, security space.